exciting you know, moment um, for myself, for our practice, for the city um, that, that wreaked a lot of havoc. Um, and one of the big questions was, you know, how do we recover? Um, but how do we build back better and prevent um, the, you know, we can't prevent storms like that, but um, how do we prevent the devastating effects again? Um, and there were lots of efforts to recover and rebuild after Sandy. But one of the things that um, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, which issues grants for um, community disaster recovery, did was say, let's set aside some of that money to specifically go to projects that come out of a design competition, um, that come out not of saying, you know, this is exactly where we need to build back and what we need to do, but bring on um, teams of design-led teams to, to rethink how we might do this differently. Um, and we uh, at SCAPE, oops, I'm gonna try to, why isn't this not turning? Hmm, oh, they're open. Now it's turning too fast. Um, we put together such a team, a, a, um, an inter interdisciplinary collaborative team that we led with partners that were uh, engineers, coastal engineers, modelers, ecologists, educators, architects, graphic designers, writers um, to tackle this issue on all fronts. And our starting point was, um, I think kind of summed up in these maps, which was on the left, you see there were a lot of maps and documentation being done of the devastating effects of, of, of Sandy and of what flooding is and of water and so many efforts to sort of say, how can we keep the water out? How can we wall ourselves off? But, um, you know, there's also, the, if not for New York Harbor, then not New York City or the region, right? The, you know, the, the Hudson River, the harbor, the, the Atlantic Ocean are sort of fundamental to this whole region, to Long Island, to New York City, to New Jersey. And it's the basis of our economy and the, the basis of so many ecosystems. So it's fundamentally part of who we are. And so we set forward to say, okay, what are, you know, at this intersection of exposed shorelines that are at risk, but where there are these uh, complex nearshore ecosystems and these waterfront communities that are, you know, have their livelihood and culture really tied to the water. Um, you know, not, not everywhere is, you know, lower Manhattan and how are these communities gonna adapt? And how are they gonna adapt in a way that works with the ecosystems that are there or may be there in the future with our rapidly changing climate, right? How are we gonna work with this? And so we came up with this concept of the shallows um, and looking at these shorelines, um, not as a line, but as these thickened layered spaces and, this diagram, which has really <laughs> guides us even today, um, as we adapt to climate change on our shorelines, how do we combine risk reduction with enhancing ecosystems and fostering a culture um, of resilience? And there were many iterations and options and things, but the long and short is the living breakwaters, um, a necklace of offshore breakwaters that create habitat and attenuate waves um, was the proposal that we ultimately um, came to and was awarded funding. Um, this, one of the things that we talked about a lot is these breakwaters can do a lot of things. They can reduce erosion, lessen wave impacts, provide water, sorry, provide habitat, but they don't keep the water out. And so this dynamic of reducing risk, um, but engaging these systems was important. And so the thing about this project is it's not intended to be just a breakwater. It really is intended to be one piece of a layered approach to coastal adaptation and resilience that builds a culture of resilience, not just physically physical spaces. Um, and so that was really, the, the concept, and this is the, the bird's eye rendering that came out of the competition, showing this necklace of breakwaters off of the south shore of Staten Island and Tottenville. If you're not familiar with Tottenville, this is literally the southernmost point of New York City. Um, and I, you know, I like, I think we had a good idea um, because uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development did award $60 million for the implementation of the project to New York State. Um, and since that time, since 20, well, it was 2014 when we submitted, 2015 when it was awarded, um, we've been working really closely with the New York Governor's Office of Storm Recovery to develop that into a design and, and just last year started construction. 
Um, but as you can see, that was a very long process to get here. Um, so I wanna kind of walk you through um, what some of the aspects of this project that took it from this vision to the design and now to the reality um, that's being constructed. Um, you know, it, you noticed our team was big to um, develop the concept, but our team was enormous to realize something like that. And I'd be remiss to not acknowledge everyone um, directly on our design team, our lead coastal engineers, COE, um, Arcadis Engineering, who did all the hydrodynamic modeling, CARC Ecological Marine Consulting, the ecologists we work with, um, WSP, who did the geotechnical engineering, um, and MFS and Prudent Engineering, who supported with surveying, and then is wide array of partners, including the Billion Oyster Project, um, and um, all the firms that worked on the environmental, and of course, the New York Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, who is leading um, leading this project and really has been able to make it happen. So I take us back to this concept of combining risk reduction, ecology, and culture, and we'll kind of share how the breakwaters achieve each of this, these themes. So, you know, how do we prevent this from happening? These are pictures um, from the south shore of Staten Island. Um, on the left, uh, you know, the result immediately after Sandy, um, that, you know, the things that broke waves after Sandy was the first line of houses on the shoreline. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a difference between having a foot of water in your living room and your house being knocked off its foundation or as in the case here, um, you know, lives lost if they were swept out to sea. But as we, as we looked at this um, shoreline, you know, something more systemic um, came up too, which was that the beach was slowly eroding over time gradually. Um, and so, uh, you know, this was the other aspect, this chronic erosion um, with that beach being not just a public open space and public park, but also sort of the first line of defense um, in uh, attenuating waves and, and prevent, helping prevent flooding. <clears throat> so how do breakwaters work? Um, they do exactly what they sound like. They break waves. And so again, they can break those damaging storm waves, but even smaller breakwaters can uh, break those uh, smaller waves that drive erosion. And by breaking waves, they can slow the, what we call longshore transport and help sediment build up behind them and hold or build back an eroding beach. Um, and so we did a lot of analysis to really understand what you see here in red, the historic erosion and model projected erosion, as well as look at the areas that were at risk for those uh, storm waves. Um, and we developed many iterations and models of the breakwater configurations to optimize how they did that. So you'll notice uh, my 60% design, that number is 19. We did many, many, um, uh, oh, oh! can people not, I'm getting a couple messages that people can't see pictures. Are others having, can I just pause for a minute? Are others having uh, trouble with the images? I, I can see fine, okay. but um, okay. uh, right. I'm also on a laptop. Okay, so maybe it's a phone thing, sorry. Um, so this was change modeling to look at how with these different configurations of breakwaters, the shoreline changed. And so this is something we could do with computer models. Um, but we also looked at how they attenuate waves and storms. And we did this in an ever refined process where we could kind of just understand the direction of waves to a quick model that took a couple hours to a run to a more complex model, you know, where the configuration and the, um, land had to be entered into a model and run, you know, over a 24 hour period. Um, and so as we developed the design, this got more and more refined. But we also did physical models and what's, you know, there's a computer models can do a lot of things for modeling how water moves. But when we look at, you know, the structural stability of coastal infrastructure, um, physical models are still often how it's done. And so these are 20 scale models that were built in a wave tank, um, different cross sections and ran waves at them. And every single rock you see here, they're color coded so we can see how they move. Every single rock, every single little armor unit, I'll talk about more later, is to scale both in size and weight. Um, and, and that's how we tell, you know, are they gonna move? 
So there's this really robust approach to making sure that we are reducing risk and the breakwaters themselves are standing up to that risk. So the other key critical component is the living part of the living breakwaters, right? They're designed to create habitats and enhance ecosystems. Um, and what does that look like? Um, it starts from designing from the perspective of, you know, who you're designing for, fish, particularly in this instance, juvenile fish, right? Who are all the critters that use the breakwaters? So I'm a landscape architect, just as I think about, you know, the different people who are going to use a park, we really needed to think about the different species um, that were going to use the breakwaters and how they might use it. And critical to that was creating these niches and crevices and complex surface that different state, different types of aquatic organisms at different stages in their life could use and inhabit, right? And these are things that we see in the natural environment, right? Um, complex surfaces uh, allow for more complex biodiverse life. Um, and we looked to naturally occurring reefs to think about this concept of what we called reef streets, um, areas where we could really increase the surface area and create narrow um, spaces so that fish could uh, shelter in the structure and feed in the street. And we also looked at, um, we also look to the area around us. One thing is, is this, you know, we're not designing for something that doesn't live there already. We're not designing something that's never existed before. And what we found actually is, you know, there's a lot, there is some structured habitat in the bay. The, the foundations of the navigation channel markers is interesting to see actually had, you know, more diversity um, of some of these aquatic uh, species than some of the flat sandy bottomed areas of the bay. And so that helped us understand who might live there and the characteristics of the area around it. Um, and so we kind of mapped this out, right? Just like I said, just as, you know, who do we design for in terms of people? We, we defined these groups and fish and the species that we designed for and started not only to design the form of the breakwaters, but select our materials to be not just robust and survive in the, in the waves and the modeling, like that physical modeling showed, but also um, be places that habitat, uh, that could create habitat for species. Um, and that's really one of the areas where we used not just rock, but this bioenhancing concrete, this ecological concrete, um, the ones we're using are e-concrete. And so they exist in the breakwaters you'll see later as these tide pools, which help retain water between tides and create additional habitat. And then these armor units that sit in the subtidal region. And you see these relief and texture, and that's that surface complexity, right? Um, and then I have different treatments that can attach onto them, ultimately when the breakwaters are built to add even greater complexity. We also looked at, I mentioned before, this concept of the reef street. And so these are rocky protrusions on the wave side of the breakwaters that create reef-like habitat. And so we wanted to know, well, you know, how, why, how far apart should they be? What angles should they be at? And we did, you know, additional modeling to understand to make sure the water was going to move. It wasn't going to become stagnant, but not be too fast to scour it out and not be comfortable um, for fish and other species. Um, and so we refined those and all of this study and thinking kind of came together into this, these structures that were not only um, resilient to the wave energy, but created these different places and habitats for critters. So ultimately we hope underwater will look like this. Uh, the other piece of the project that I think is really important is, you know, I talked a lot about the, the fish and the critters, but is this is p our people. Um, you know, we are reducing risk to people, but we also want to communicate and raise the awareness of that risk, but also awareness of the health of the harbor and really cultivate our next generation of stewards. So, um, you know, starting during even during the competition, we created interactive materials and models to really engage people with the process. Um, and it was all part of this vision. And this is a map of all the different, <laughs> many, many schools along the Staten Island waterfront and thinking about their connection to the water and how the breakwaters could maybe be a part of that learning environment. Um, and this is also critical because it tapped into the cultural and economic history of Tottenville. So this little map you see on the right, all of those teals are historic oyster beds. And these are the naturally occurring beds. By the 1800s, they had been staked out, as you see in this um, picture, and farmed. It almost looked like 
uh, uh, agriculture field for oysters off the south shore of Staten Island, and they were one of the major oyster producers in the region. Um, but that population was devastated due to over harvesting, pollution of the harbor, and dredging. Um, and as some of you, you some of you may be familiar with the Billion Oyster Project, um, that is partnering. Uh, education with the restoration of, of hopefully a billion oysters to New York Harbor. Um, and we saw the breakwaters as really strong potential habitat for oysters. And ultimately there will be oysters seated on the breakwaters. But even starting during the competition, we work with the Harbor School to develop and design this oyster gardening manual, which is still used today. And started building out structures and oyster restoration with our partners. Um, as we moved into the design phase, we continued to engage with um, schools across Staten Island, across the, the um, city, and the Billion Oyster Project that does active engagement with particularly middle schools was really, as part of the project, you know, sort of expand their, um, their engagement and the schools on Staten Island that they engaged. Um, and we had throughout the project a lot of engagement. This is at Conference House Park, the park that's just on shore where there is sort of a permanent exhibit um, about the Breakwaters project. Um, we did workshops to, to help use the Breakwaters to educate about um, harbor uh, aquatic species, not just oysters, but others that might inhabit the Breakwaters. Um, and even part of our work um, was the Billion Oyster Project, but also the students coming at, to the open houses and talking about um, the work and their at, at restoration work and projects themselves. And that was really exciting. Um, and, you know, I think it was a impression of, um, of us at the time, but um, in early 2020, uh, completed and rolled out an online curriculum <laughs> that uh, um, helped uh, use the living breakwaters as uh, a way to learn about the history and culture and ecology of the harbor. And so I think I just wanna you know, emphasize that there's a lot of physical things you'll see here, but this network, um, and these are active restoration projects and piloting some of the techniques that will ultimately be restored on the breakwaters, um, that this was a really critical um, component of the project, both to inform it, but also really engage uh, not just the next generation of stewards, but the next generation of decision makers um, who will be making decisions about adaptation in our harbor and climate change. Um, also, uh, the Billion Oyster Project expanded their shell recycling uh, program through this project, and many of these shells will be used in the restoration on the breakwaters. So there was all of this effort going on for many years, but now, <laughs> finally, um, in uh, last fall, we actually started construction. Um, this was our water breaking, if you will, um, the first uh, piece of the breakwater laid out there on the crane offshore. Um, and I'll just kind of share with you some details of, of the, the construction and what's and uh, how that is unfolding. So this is a this is the a bird's eye view of the breakwater. There are eight breakwaters in the final design. Um, breakwaters A and B, um, and they're getting uh, are are smaller and under construction now. And break uh, construction will proceed from south uh, this sort of southwest corner to the northeast um, in that rough order. And it will be going on for about three years. So we started um, last year. Construction will wrap up uh, in 2024. This year, we'll, you'll probably uh, see the completion of those first four breakwaters, A through D. Um, and again, just you know, if you've been out on the shore or you've uh, flown over in a plane, um, the, uh, the first two, A and B, are actually almost uh, complete. And um, C and D uh, are, um, have their base and, and stone core laid, and you'll start seeing those really emerge later this summer and in the fall. But construction is actually taking place across six locations. It's not just the site in the harbor. Um, the stone for the breakwaters are coming from Carver Quarry in Johnstown, New York. They uh, go to the port of Coimans, um, where they're sorted or put on a barge and take a 24-hour trip down the Hudson River. Um, there are staging grounds and yards uh, in Perth Amboy, 
um, where Weeks Marine, the contractor who's building the contract, um, loads and unloads things. Um, and I think not shown here, not on the map, but shown over here on the left, um, there's a, a New Jersey precast plant just outside of Trenton, New Jersey that's manufacturing and they've actually just completed all of those ecological concrete, e concrete units for the project. So if you have been on shore um, or seen the project from anywhere, this is probably what you've seen. Um, this is a pretty unique set of equipment that Weeks um, manufactured just for the project. Uh, we call it the E-Crane or the 537. Um, it is a, a very large crane. I can tell you the view from the top is pretty cool, um, but it moves on a track back and forth and has a very long swing arm and it's able to pick up um, uh, right now, I think it's fitted, this picture, it's fitted for those marine mattresses, but it picks up the stone and, and places them um, and manages all the equipment there. Uh, and so what's getting built? Um, we talked about the breakwaters and how they work. I referred to the reef ridges, um, but there's two sort of main types of breakwaters in the system. Lower crested breakwaters, um, because they're in areas that don't have as big storm wave vent, uh, risks. And so we're really dealing with the smaller eroding waves and then these higher crested breakwaters. And the low crested breakwaters have these dips or crenellations in the ridges. And that's to allow um, for intertidal habitat. So at low tide, those at a high tide, those go underwater and there's tide pools in them to retain water. And these are the ones that are being built. The break right now, um, the larger breakwaters that have the reef ridges on them, um, you won't see going into construction until next year, but this kind of will show you what they'll look like. So um, in these first shallow breakwaters, the base layer is formed with what we call a marine mattress, which is kind of like a big mesh bag full of rocks. Um, and that's there to distribute the weight, um, help uh, create some um, barrier between the sand and make sure that you know the breakwaters, we don't want them to settle or settle disproportionately. So they're forming that base layer and those were installed last year. Um, and on a clear day, which doesn't always happen, uh, as that you could see those um, marine mattresses and a shot from under the water. Now, what goes on top of that, um, the larger breakwaters will have a core stone with this two layer thick armor stone, but the smaller breakwaters that you're seeing in construction now are actually made entirely of this armor stone and the e-concrete material. Um, and so this is a shot from Carver Quarry working all year round. And, and this isn't just, pick out any stone and use it, right? The stones are carefully sized and they inspect them at the quarry. And then again, when they come down to make sure they're the right size and dimensions um, for use in the breakwater. Once they make that trip down the harbor um, and they get placed by this, the E-crane. And now we're kind of seeing the view from the E-crane, but they pick up raw, these armor stones individually um, and place them. And this little shot on the bottom left is from the cab. The picker is actually equipped with a GPS unit. So the operator knows exactly where um, they're placing stones. Um, these are also used to place the, e the ecological concrete units. So I mentioned those, those armor units that you see in the center. And then on the left and the right, what's getting placed now are those tide pools that retain water um, at inner tides. And um, this is just some examples of how they're formed. They're cast um, to get all those ridges and textures and surface complexity and moved and positioned very um, carefully out of the molds. And so we use that E-crane to place them again, one at a time. And ultimately they, they find their home in the breakwater and you can see them sort of in action here at low tide, um, but retaining that water. And what that does is create an additional layer of habitat, you know, and, and diversity when you get that new, new forms of life that really like to exist in that intertidal zone. Um, so once they're placed, they still need adjustment and we have, uh, two of these amphibious excavators. They are just like a normal excavator, except they are not sitting on the bottom of the bay. Uh, they're floating on giant pontoons. Um, and you see these spotters directing them and making sure that all those armor stones and tide pools are, are, are carefully placed. Um, they may seem huge. These stones are like two and a half, three tons. Uh, um, but you know, water is really powerful. And so we need to make sure that they're carefully interlocked. 
Um, we do a lot of inspections and observations just to make sure, working with the contractor to make sure they understand the design specifications and that they can bring up uh, questions or challenges that arise in the field, that there's sort of regular and active involvement and conversation about how everything is coming together. Um, and just some more shots. You can see in the top left that those crenellations and that, that moment kind of at high tide when part of the breakwater is above and below water. So one of the ex really exciting things is these are, you know, they're under construction. <laughs> this is an active construction site, but we're already seeing organisms. If you saw the shots in the marine mattresses later, they're already covered with algae and tunicates. Um, we are seeing um, shells being a lot of birds and shells being dropped by birds to uh, to um, sort of access the clams inside on the right um you know during barnacle season the lower breakwater the lower rocks on the breakwater that have only been in the water for a matter of like a month or months um completely encrusted with barnacles and um one of our favorite characters this uh, friendly harbor seal who's been hauling out um, and setting himself on the on that first breakwater so if you have a chance, this is kind of a shot. We took a shore walk on shore with some of um, community uh, community members um, down in Tottenville the other day. But you know, if you are if you have time to take a detour down to Conference House Park, um, you can walk right out from the visitor center and see the breakwaters under construction. Um, any day of the week. The contractors get out there pretty early usually and they do and these breakwaters have to play the tide. So your best bet is working hours around high tide and they'll they'll be out there with the cranes, the cranes moving and the barges going. Um, so that's that's where we've been and where we are and I am happy to like to answer some questions or talk more about the project. Um, but just really excited to share it with everybody. Yes, thank you, Pippa. That was Super fascinating. If folks would like to ask questions um, live on your microphone, please do. Uh, you can also type them in the chat. Uh, I'll start with a, a, a quick question. Um, how did you go from being a landscape architect on land to uh, getting involved in the sea? Um, well, I mean, I think, I've always had my background before I studied landscape architecture was in environmental science and public policy. So I've always really, you know, been fascinated with the intersection of uh, ecosystems and design. And I think that's really the focus of our practice at SCAPE. Um, you know, we, we do design parks and plazas, but I think we're most um, intrigued with how can we work with and engage with natural systems um, to, to enable them to thrive and for us as people to coexist with them. And I think that's particularly the case when we you know, are dealing with climate change. Um, and to me, the water is fascinating because it's, you know, it, it is a place and um, we, we really, we live on the shoreline and the shoreline, like I think I said at the beginning, isn't just this line, right? You're not on land and then in the water. Um, in the coastal environment, the tide goes in and out every day. Shallow water habitats are there with sea level rise. What is land now? Maybe wa water tomorrow. Um, so I think that, you know, how we can, and, and I love the beach. I love wetlands. Um, I think how we can adapt to, to live with that dynamic environment is really fascinating, but also really important um, because it's not static. It's constantly changing every day, but also over, you know, over long periods of time. And I think learning how to coexist and live in that really dynamic, ever-changing environment is really important. Um, you know, to our to our own survival, but I think can um, you know can provide us with um, larger ideas and guidance on how we might adapt um, to climate change more broadly. So interesting. Yeah. So we have some questions coming in. Um, Ira asks, uh, "What is the plan for monitoring?" Yeah. So. Um, there is a very robust monitoring plan. Um, you, you have to have one in place for DEC, but monitoring was really important to us because 
we want to we want to make sure that their work the breakwaters are working as envisioned. But we also want to learn from them. So in terms of physical monitoring. Um, over the course of the design, we, we, um, we did an overall survey. We took beach transect surveys, which allowed us to just check the position of the shoreline and near shore and if it was changing during construction. And those will con continue um, you know, twice a year seasonally for the first five years and then every five years after that. So we can monitor that long-term shoreline change. We're also gonna be doing ecological monitoring. Um, and this is like, this is one of the really exciting pieces because it's going to be done to help us inform like you know are there any impacts on the existing ecosystems which is what some of the regulatory agencies are worried about but for us it'll help us tell like how how effective the breakwaters are but also built into the breakwaters we've been very strategic and worked really closely with the ec ecologists on the project um, to sort of cluster and group these different ecological treatments um, so they're breakwaters with reef ridges and without reef ridges, with the crenellations and without. We have some that are going to have oysters on them, some that won't. We've clustered the treatment, the different treatments that go into these ecological concrete units. And so not only are we going to be able to tell the benefit, we've got, you know, we've been very careful that they're laid out in a way that'll generate statistically significant results and can help us understand, you know, if doing these e-concrete alone is good or doing the e-concrete with oysters is better. So I think that's been a really exciting piece of the project. And we've included we've included a control, our third breakwater, breakwater C, if you saw it looked pretty simple because it is, that's the breakwater that has no none of the extra ecological enhancements on it. So Part of this for us is really being able, what I've learned when I'm trying to do, to design and build uh, what we call nat nature-based features, right? Is these are based on nature, but they're not exactly natural and there's not a lot of good information out there. And so it's really important that as we design projects, we design monitoring for them so that we can pass on that learning um, and design them better and make better habitat the next time. So thank you for that question. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating that they're all, they'll all be different. So you'll you have um, yeah. a lot to 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 find out, and um, yeah, the the follow up to that is w will those um, monitoring results be made public? I think so. Um, you know, I don't know the whole plan for that. So uh, New York State DEC will take over the monitoring, and as a state agency, I do think those will be made public. But that's something that we'll definitely be advocating for and working with them when we get to that point. Um, I can do. And Kate, Kate asks, how will we know if this project is successful? <sighs> I mean, the, it's one is that monitoring in terms of the ecological piece. Um, we'll be looking at the shoreline change. So one is the reduced erosion and and you know, the beach staying where it is. I mean, even over the course of working on this project and developing the design, I can see that that shoreline has eroded um, and that the faces of those temporary dunes, the trap bags, you know, anytime sand's been placed are exposed. And so I think seeing that stay in place um, is gonna be huge. And, you know, I, I don't want another storm like Sandy to come, but the other thing will be, you know, what, what happens on the shoreline if that does happen? Um, because, you know, water will still come in, but, you know, the way, the big damaging waves won't be there. But I think the, you know, the most immediately visible are going to be that, um, the reduction and reversal of erosion on the shoreline and the, um, and the, the, the habitat. And I hope the fishermen can be a good indicator of the success of the habitat. We might not have to wait for monitoring results. Uh, Holly asks about um, when there's storm surge, how do the breakwaters help? Yeah, um, and thank you for those who have uh, shared the Conference House Park location. That is the best way to get there. Um, uh, yeah, so when storm waves come, you get elevated, when you have storm surges and hurricanes, you get elevated water levels, but also a lot of waves, usually wind-driven waves on top of that. And so the breakwaters that are under construction now, this lower part of the bay is actually very shallow. And so many of those waves are broken before they reach shore or the beach is um, 
uh, and re remnant onshore dunes are still stopping them. But as the breakwaters, as the construction um, moves northward, you'll see that you get taller and higher breakwaters. Um, and that's because these damaging waves come with elevated water levels. The surge levels here in uh, the east and south shore of Staten Island um, and the wave heights were actually higher than most locations during Sandy. You know, I think here in the Rockaways got particularly pummeled. Um, and for this, the east and south shore of Staten Island, that's because they're positioned right across from New York Bight. And so the waves are just driven right in here. But it also means that they, the large waves generally come from a particular direction. So we were able to position the breakwaters, those high crested breakwaters, um, you know, in locations where they're going to knock down those waves. So what happens is the waves break on the breakwaters instead of breaking on the first high object they hit on shore, which, you know, we hope is a dune, but in the case of this shoreline during Sandy was the first line of buildings. Um, and so that's, they're taking that wave action out before it reaches the shore. So that's how they work during um, storms. Thank you. Uh, Mitch asks, was uh, there consideration of using T groins? I think those are, are those positioned in a perpendicular yeah. manner? Okay. Yeah, and there are some, if you walk down the, the shore um, here, if you kind of walk north up from Conference House Park, you'll see some groins. Um, and what you see with groins is you get, um, the way that this works is long, like the reason that the beach is eroding is something called longshore transport. The waves crash up on shore, they pull sand off, and that usually has a dominant direction. Here it's from the southeast, um, sorry, the northeast to the southwest. And I'm going to try to get a map so I can show you. And what happens is a groin holds the beach by holding the sediment up shore and not letting it wash down. But what means is that sediment doesn't get to the area south of the groin. And so you see erosion behind it. And actually, if we look um, at this joint, you'll see there's some older groins where that's really happened. And we saw worse erosion just downdrift. Um, now, breakwaters um, slow that transport, but they don't stop it. So we were able to, with the layout of the breakwaters and the modeling, um, understand where we can place them relative to shore and how far apart to make sure that that sand, um, you know, that sand keeps moving. So you'll see here these red zones and you'll notice like right here is a headland that has almost a groin on it. And then these little groins up here and you see that you're kind of getting that erosion downdrift and that's a pattern we saw. And so that works when you don't have anything downdrift that works when you have an active beach renourishment program where someone's coming in and adding sand below or moving some of the sand to the south. But we know that that's not a maintenance regime or an operations budget that this area has. And so rather than having something that interrupt, totally interrupted that sediment movement, that sand movement, we were looking for a strategy um, that, that helped slow it down, but let it move and distribute on the shoreline. So that it's a little technical, but I hope that answers the question. Basically, uh, to to have tea groins, you you have to have an active maintenance. Um, Usually. Okay. Yep. Was there consideration of using both, or is it the same same kind of situation? Yeah, we. Um, sorry, I lost my chat here. I don't know why. Um, we uh, we did not. I mean, we, we looked at them as an option to break waters, but it was, it didn't, it didn't go past that, that phase because of the downside and that it, they were going to actually exacerbate erosion in this location. So we Got didn't it. take them really any further. Okay. Um, Emily asks, what are some of your current challenges and uh, the challenges leading up to this point? In the project? Um, well, I mean, I think the, that it's new. Um, the process of like getting all the buy off and sign in, particularly um, sign off, buy in, uh, buy in and sign off, particularly from the regulatory agencies, because this is something you know new and different. And also, they're very wary and concerned, rightfully so, about placing uh, 
things in the placing stuff in the water, right? And, and fill in the water um, because we have a pretty bad track record <laughs> in and around New York City of landfill. Um, and so we really had to do our due, uh, due diligence in terms of talking about making sure that we were you know, did all the studies and proving that there were no negative environmental impacts, all the modeling, um, and also that the project could deliver the benefits that we hoped it would. Um, and so that was a really long process. Um, and I think also, you know, with just something that that is um, trying to engage with dynamic systems, figuring out ways to model and test that and also start to understand, um, you know, how to build it and what it will cost. So I think that that made it a, a long endeavor, but we really hope that the lessons learned that we had will help others, you know, design maybe not living breakwaters, but infrastructure like this um, more easily in the future. That's great. And Meredith asks, how did you choose uh, the, the quarry? And yeah, I saw that. Okay. Um, there weren't a lot of qualified quarries that was actually kind of hard to find. Um, a lot of quarries just do like smaller stone and gravel production. Um, but when you're trying to blast and get two ton, you know, two and a half, two ton, two and a half ton plus armor stone, it's not easy to find. Um, and so um, that was like a concern, but the the way the project was bid is the general contractor came with a quarry. Um, but to kind of get the word out and know, the governor's office actually did like a, um, a request for qualifications, like before the project went out to bid to kind of get the word out to quarries that this was happening, um, get the information, you know, there's gonna, we're gonna be looking for a big supply of like armor stone soon. So I think that may have helped, um, but the contractor, when they proposed for the project, um, brought with them the quarries that they had selected. Um, but there were very specific requirements for the type of stone that was needed. And they had to show that they could produce that um, and do that. And there, there wasn't a huge selection. Got it. Um, and, and this is granite stone? It is granite. Um, the qualifying stone was would be like a granite or a diabase. There were like pretty specific specifications for dimensions and weight and also hardness. Um, but the stone that is being used is granite from upstate New York. Got it. Uh, Lisa asks, uh, for some time there's been a plan for an onshore resiliency and park improvement project to complement the, the breakwaters. Yeah. Um, can you speak a bit about that? And is it still going to happen? Yes, the Tottenville Shoreline Protection Project. And I, I don't know a lot about where things are, but I will share what I know, because um, we worked pretty closely with the team developing that project. And the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery really shepherded that along. But because that project will be onshore, um, they've handed it off to the New York City Parks Department um, because they, because all of this land, I mean, we kind of know Conference House Park is the south, but Conference House Park actually extends all the way up to Page Avenue along the shoreline. It's all parks land. So I know they have um, secured funding that I think fills the gap that they were looking for, and they've finished the final design. Um, so there's, I just, pieces falling into place. And I hope there'll be more news and information. But from what I know, the project's moving forward. Good to, good to know. Um, great. I think that's all the questions. So uh, Pippa, thank you so much. I, I learned a lot. And I was lucky to have gone on the, the, the walk that you led uh, last week. I learned a lot then and I, I learned even more now. So, so thank you so much. Um, they got the right woman for the job. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for letting me share this. As you can see, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a project, but it's a passion of mine and I, I hope everyone can get out to see it. And you know, if you have uh, questions, please follow up. And I, you know, I don't think I put the website on the last slide, but if you Google Living Breakwaters, Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, you'll you'll make it to the um, 
the web page and uh, and uh, we do monthly construction updates. So every month we post sort of an update, new photos of construction so you can track our progress that way. So thank you. Thank you. And hopefully we'll go, we'll get to do another walk, maybe at one of our upcoming uh, cleanups uh, yeah. at Conference House Park. Very good. And that'll be right. in October, hopefully. All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks to everybody for, for joining. Pippa, that was great. And we hope to do it again sometime. All right. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone.